Central European Center. Um, uh, also with me today is Chris Case, my counterpart uh, in, in co-directing the East Central European Center, lecture in Polish. And we are both very uh, happy to welcome today's speaker, uh, Tomasz Stark, who uh, is a senior research fellow uh, at the Institute of History, um, uh, the Research Center for the Humanities in Budapest. Uh, his research interests include the Holocaust, forced population movements during the Second World War and the early post-war period, uh, and the history of Hungarian prisoners of war and civilian internees in Soviet captivity. Uh, he is the author of numerous publications on these topics on Hungarians. And since my Hungarian phonetics are a little weak, I'm going to spare you those. Uh, uh, one work that came out in English is uh, Hungarian Jews during the Holocaust and after the Second World War, 1939 to 1949, a statistical review. Um, and um, uh, is, is uh, really ought to be in Hungarian is prodigious. And we're very glad that he could come here. He offered a couple of topics that he was ready to uh, uh, roll out for us. Um, but but this one got our attention uh, as being kind of of the moment. Uh, so he's going to speak today on weaponizing memory politics in Hungary. Uh, and he said he would speak for about 35 or 40 minutes and then open it up for your questions. So uh, please welcome Tamás Stark. I give him the floor. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak uh, about the mem memory politics, memory politics of the, of the current uh, regime in Hungary, because it is it is it is an interesting subject. I think it is a challenging subject, uh, and I'm a historian, so I deal with the past, but uh, but memory politics. Is a, is a bridge between the past and the present. So this is why I'm interested in memory politics. However, my main field of interest uh, is the Second World War, the Holocaust, as, as, as you mentioned. Uh, my, my presentation has, has three parts. In the first part, I would like to explain the main idea of the, of the memory politics of the current Hungarian regime. In the second part, I will explain how historical traumas uh, are presented in memory politics, how memory politics uses Hungarian traumas in the 20th century to support, to support the, the political aims of the regime. And in the third part, uh, I will speak about two monuments. Uh, I would like to start my presentation with a story. It's a real story, it's a short story, but a powerful story. Uh, uh, a story I heard that a uh, rock and roll musician in the 70s received a package uh, from, the, from the West. And he opened the box and immediately he inhaled the air from the box because it was the air of, of, uh, it was the air from the from the free bird, and uh, we do not know what actually was in the box. So it is not part of the story what he ordered, but uh, the essence of the story is that the air was much more important than the real content of the box because because so it it happened. Uh, so this short story I think symbolizes where the attitude. Of the Hungarian generation in the in the in the communist era uh, towards towards the West and towards the towards the free world. Uh, but after the fall of the communism, freedom arrived at Hungary. But now it looks uh, if we could not value the freedom for what the Hungarian society had wished so much and for what Hungarians fought in 1956 during the Hungarian revolution and freedom fight. After the fall of communism, there was a consensus in the Hungarian society and each political parties agreed that Hungary should join the NATO and Hungary should join the European Union. More than, uh, more than 80% of Hungarians voted for NATO membership and for the 
European Union membership. The current regime does its best to destroy this pro-Western consensus. To do so, it uh, uses nationalist populist rhetoric. The current Hungarian regime's uh, policy uh, is uh, extremely anti-Western, anti-American by pursuing friendly policy towards authoritarian regimes such as Russia, Turkey, and China. And I remember a couple of years ago, there was, a, there was, a inter, there was an interview with the Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, and he mentioned uh, that uh, he gave the list of the most successful countries in the world. But that happened a couple of years ago. And, and he mentioned four countries he looked upon as good examples for, for the future, for the Hungarian future. And he mentioned, uh, he mentioned Singapore, he mentioned Turkey, he mentioned Russia and China. So it was interesting. So this policy, this policy has won the support of a large part of the population. This supportive public attitude is a strange phenomenon in a country that is a member of the NATO and the European Union, in a country that is traditionally uh, oriented towards the West and whose struggles for independence and for democracy were crushed by Russia and also by the Soviet Union. In my presentation, I would like to show how current regime has used memory politics to persuade the public to abandon values that were generally accepted even 10, 15 years ago and to accept anti-West and pro-Russian policy. The reason of the success of the memory politics is that it is built on the real or the presumed grievances of the Hungarian nation. Mr. Orban said many times that the entire world is in our debt. The entire world is in our debt. And national grievances are linked to the attitude that Hungarians have always been victims through their thousand years of history. So the central element of the regime, regime's memory politics is that the nation has always suffered from the oppression of the great powers and uh, that we have always been victims. The constant reference to the national grievances and victimhood is not a new phenomenon in Hungary. We need to go back 200 years when the Hungarian national anthem was written, it was in uh, 1823. So we celebrated the, 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 the 200th anniversary of the born of the Hungarian national anthem. And the first slide uh, shows the, the first uh, stanza of the national anthem, which expresses well the Hungarian attitude, I think. And I try to read it. Oh God, bless the nation of Hungary with your grace and bounty. Extend over your guarding arm during strife with its enemies, long torn by ill fate, bring upon it a time of relief. This nation has suffered for all sins of the past and of the future. So it was written 200 years ago in a very pessimistic, in a very pessimist mood. Although the most dramatic events in the history of the nation came much later, I think here the freedom, the freedom fight against the Habsburg Empire uh, in, in 1848 and 49. I think about the First World War and the Trianon Peace Treaty, and then the Second World War, the Holocaust, and the, and the communist regime, the era of communist regime. But anyway, the national anthem which was written 200 years ago, it's still its pessimistic view and attitude that Hungarians have always suffered through their history still defines the Hungarian mentality. It was always trendy to see the history of the nation as a national martyrology, 
as a list of tragic events. The national martyrology always portrays, always portray Hungary as a victim. Always portray Hungarians as victims who always had, who always have to struggle with foreign enemies and with foreign ideologies for survival. But I have to emphasize that there are advantages to the position that we were always victims. If we were always victims, we do not have to face our past critically. And uh, we are not responsible for our defeats and for our failures because we are always victims. So we have nothing, nothing to do with the defeats and the failures. Uh, the emphasis on victimhood is central to the regime's memory politics. Indeed, the regime reinforces, reinforces this victimhood of the nation. As Prime Minister Orban Victor recently said, and this is the next slide. Uh, I can use this for continuing. Yeah, this is the next, yes. He said, no nation in the world could have survived the traumas and suffering that Hungarian nation has gone through in the last hundred years. Uh, the memory politics blames the West in general and liberalism in particular, particular for all troubles Hungary suffered, especially in the 20th century. And now I would like to, to speak about how different traumas are represented in the current memory politics. First of all, I would like to speak the Trianon, the, tri the trauma of Trianon, the Trianon, it's the name of a castle in Paris where the Hungarian peace treaty was concluded after the First World War. It was 1921. It was 1921. Uh, the revision of the peace treaty was the main aim of the political elite of, the political elite of Hungary during the interwar years and during the Second World War. Since Hungary was ruled or run uh, by Nicholas Horthy in the interwar period and during the Second World War, we call this period of the Nicholas Horthy, Horthy regime, the period of Horthy regime. After the Second World War, the tri Trianon trauma became a taboo, like many other topics. So mentioning of Trianon was considered as a provocation against the communist world, uh, which was told that it solved all social and ethnic problems. But I remember quite well, I was a university student. I graduated at the Karl Marx University of Economics. And uh, I was university student in the early 80s. And, uh, and I wrote articles to the university paper quite often. And for the 60th anniversary of the Trianon Peace Treaty, it was 1981, I wrote an article and the editorial board, of, editorial board of the journal accepted my article to publish. But finally it was not published because the, because the leader of the communist party at the, at, the, at, the, at the university refused the publication. He was not angry, there was no problem at all, but he, but he told us that that's a, that's a taboo subject and it would be better not to be with Trianon, the Trianon Peace Treaty, because it was really a taboo, I remember. Trianon in the past was a taboo, but in the last decade, Trianon became the focal point of the national martyrology. Uh, it became the biggest trauma in Hungary's history, or it has been presented as the biggest trauma in the history of Hungary. So in the past, it was a taboo. Now it is presented as the biggest trauma in Hungarian history. In order to keep the memory of Trianon Peace Treaty fresh, dozens, perhaps hundreds of Trianon memorials were elected in the country in the last decade. And I would like to show you some Trianon memorials. Um, this is one Trianon memorial, but there are dozens of, I, I choose probably five or six memorials, you see, Trianon memorials. Tragedy. The tragedy and yes, another Trianon memorial. Uh, 
And so the, the text is, uh, those, those are the real Hungarians who paints Trianon or something like that, who paints Trianon. I mean, who, who has no problem with Trianon, PCT, those are not real Hungarian. So this is the message. Yes, okay. So these memorials I presented are provocative and nationalist, irredentist, but at the same time outline the sacrificial role of the country. Because you see, in the there is a map of Greater Hungary. So the Greater Hungary and, and you see the truncated Hungary. Uh, 2021. This year was declared as a memorial year of the Trianon Peace Treaty because it was signed 100 years before. For the anniversary, for that anniversary, a central memorial was made at the central square of Budapest, Budapest, which is located uh, next to the building of the Hungarian parliament. And, and this is a picture on the, the new memorial, Trianon Memorial. This memorial, is not provocative, but it expresses even stronger the cult of victimhood. It is a 300 feet long slope which goes underground and ends in a hole. And in the hole, there is an, a flame, an eternity flame, which, uh, which symbolizes the unity of Hungarians. The wall of the memorial is covered by the names of all settlements of Hungary before the truncation of the country, before Trianon. The monument is a symbolic grave of greater Hungary. And this memorial reminds me the valley of exterminated communities in the park of Yad Vashem at, at, at Jerusalem. Probably the idea came from the, from the Yad Vashem. Because in the Yad Vashem, the valley of exterminated communities is a symbolic grave of, 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 of destroyed Jewish communities in Eastern Europe and in Western Europe. And as I mentioned, the Trianon monument is a symbolic grave of greater, of, of greater Hungary. The trauma of Trianon is exploited by, mem by memory politics of the current regime in different ways. The trauma can be used and it is used to incite anti-Western sentiment as liberal Western powers carried out the truncation of the country. The trauma is also used to stir up emotions and to arouse, to arouse irredentist, uh, irred irredentist sentiment. The constant reference to, uh, to the tragedy of Trianon by leading figures of the country, among them Mr. Orban Victor, doesn't mean that Hungary officially claims back the lost territories, but the commemorations send the message that in spirit, we cannot, in spirit, we cannot accept the peace treaty. And the Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, expressed this policy many times. And uh, last fall, I have a picture that's a famous picture. And last fall, when Mr. Orban visited a football match and he took a scarf with the map of Greater Hungary. Of course, it was a provocation because he wanted to provoke the neighborhood countries and, and it stirred up tension, especially in Slovakia. Mm. But, uh, but it, was, it was a good propaganda interior in Hungary. And uh, so the message, the message of Mr. Orban is that although he could not regain the lost territories, but emotionally, he can compensate us for the territorial losses. And this is why he spoke so a lot on the spiritual unification of the nation. And last December, he declared to make Hungary a leading power in Central Europe. So this is a game with symbols, and also it's a provocation and the game with symbols. But it is very typical. 
the trauma of Trianon is also used to support pro-Russian sentiment in the war between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, a peace because a piece of a west a piece of western borderland of Ukraine, namely Karpat, namely Karpat or Ruthenia, was a part of Greater Hungary. And the Hungarian government does not claim this territory from Ukraine, but its propagandists, but its propagandists uh, quite often mention that in case of Russia's victory, we should liberate mm -hmm. at least part of Karpat or Ruthenia. And former, Russia, former president of Russia, Dmitry Med Medvedev, in one of his remarks, encouraged Hungarians to do just that. So, and uh, the next room of the Holocaust. Where is the place of the Holocaust in the memory politics of the current Hungarian regime? What makes this question acute is that the regime looks upon the Horthy regime with strong nostalgia. Uh, it is reflected in the architecture of the regime. Numerous representatives buildings from the era of Horthy regime, which were destroyed during the war, were rebuilt in the last decade in Budapest. In, indeed, there are some common features between the two regimes, between the Horthy regime and between the Orban regime. Both were and both are characterized by authoritarian tendencies. Formally, both regimes are parliamentary democracy, but elections were elections are manipulated, were manipulated in many, in many ways that the parties of, op of opposition should not win. But the nostalgia towards the Horthy regime is burdened with the institutional antisemitism which characterized the Hungarian public life in the interwar years and during the Second World War. Antisemitic legislation was introduced in the late 30s and uh, during the war, Jewish males had to serve in forced labor battalions and deportations began in 1941 when about 22,000 so-called alien Jews were deported to Galicia where they were uh, executed by special German units. After the German occupation, which was on March 19th, 1944, Jews from the countryside were collected and deported to death camps. This still happened in the era of Horthy regime because after the German occupation, Horthy did not resign and actually he appointed the new government which served German interests, which served Germany. So on one hand, there is a nostalgia towards the Horthy regime, but at the same time, the Hungarian regime wants to meet the expectations of the Western world by condemning the Holocaust. So there is a problem here that how to protect a regime which was involved in the Holocaust, how to protect, how to make it fancy. And so this was the dilemma of the propagandists of the current regime. And, but they found a solution. And the, the solution is written in the new Hungarian constitution because the constitution begins with the, so, with the national confession. And this national confession includes some basic statements uh, and about the values of Christian Hungary and about the Hungarian past. National confession says, Hungary lost its independence on 19th of March, 1944, the day when German army occupied Hungary, we regained our sovereignty in 1990 after the first free election. So what the National Confession tells that Hungary was the victim of Nazi Germany and we were not responsible for the Holocaust at all because Hungary was occupied. So we lost its independence. And this theory, is intensively propagated in the new history textbooks and also in the media. Of course, that's a falsification of history because Hungarian, Hungarian authority, Hungarian gendarmerie, Hungarian police, Hungarian administration orchestrated, orchestrated the Holocaust 
carried out the Holocaust, and actually the Holocaust began with the anti-Semitic legislation. But in the and that according to the memory politics, the Holocaust began after the German occupation, and we were not responsible. But about the traumas of communist regime. The first trauma Hungary suffered, Hungary went through, was the deportation of prisoners of war and civilians after the arrival of the Soviet army. Uh, we do not know exactly how many Hungarians were sent to Soviet forced labor camps. Uh, I think the best estimates corroborate between 600,000 and 700,000. It's, it's a great number that about 600, maybe 700,000 Hungarians forced labor, uh, prisoners of war, civilian internees were deported to the Soviet Union for forced labor. And about one third of the forced laborers never returned to their homeland. It's a tragedy. It was also a taboo in the, in, in the communist times. Memory politics exploits that story too. In recent years, the number of prisoners was blown up. It is, it is a tendency to magnify the number of Hungarians who were involved in this tragedy. Journalists and even some historians began to speak about 800,000 800, forced laborers and then 900,000 forced laborers. Then the number of the prisoners was put at 1 million. Last year, I saw an article with the title, more than 1 million. Uh, I think it is absurd. But anyway, magnifying the number of prisoners well fit to the theory that we Hungarians have been always victims. And of course, then uh, there is also a hidden message here. It is a hidden message. It is not really told openly. The message is that the Hungarians suffered more than Jews because, uh, because about half a million Jews were deported to death camps. But to the Soviet camps, Probably one million Hungarians were deported, even more than one Hungarian. Uh, uh, and uh, so I already mentioned that uh, scapegoating the West for the crimes of communism is a part of the regime's memory politics. And I would like to tell you some examples. 2000, 2018, State Secretary, State Secretary in the Ministry of Human Resources said on the Memorial Day of Hungarian forced laborers who were deported to the Soviet Union that the Western powers were responsible for the deportation of Hungarian civilians to the Soviet labor camps. He said the Western powers must have been informed on the tragic fate of hundreds of thousands of forced laborers but they did nothing for them. And this concept that Western allies tolerated the exploitation of Hungarian prisoners of war and civilian internees became a constant element of, of memorial speeches devoted for preserving the memory of the victims of Soviet forced labor. At the same year, in 2018, at the unveiling ceremony of a Gulag monument, which was dedicated for the memory of Hungarian Gulag victims, Prime Minister Viktor Orban in his speech accused the West for the sins of, for the crimes of the communism, mentioning that communist ideology, it's a Western invention. <laughs> and, and it appears in the Hungarian media constantly that, that it's a Western invention. The re-evaluation the re -evaluation of the Hungarian revolution and freedom fight in 1956 is another element of the regime's memory politics. After the fall of communism, the new democracy saw itself as the, as the heir of the, of the 1956 revolution. The revolution provided the moral basis for the new democratic political system. The most powerful symbolic act of the fall of the communist system of the communist regime was the, the reburial 
of Imre Nagy and other martyrs of the revolution. It was in, it was in June, I think, 1989. I attended this ceremony. Uh, who was Imre Nagy? Imre Nagy was an icon of the revolution. He, he, he was a, a, a hardliner, communist leader in the 40s, but then he became a reform communist. And during the weeks of the revolution, he became the head of the revolutionary government. And, and after the fall of the communism, uh, after the fall of the revolution, he became the martyr of the revolution since he and his colleagues were executed in, 19, in 1958. So uh, the revolution in 1956 was a very special, unique moment in Hungarian history because the revolution united the nation. The revolution had no ideology, but it, it had a spirituality. Former communists, reform communists, former social democrats, conservative-minded people as well, united, participated in the revolution. Memory politics, current memory politics, tries to purge the memory of the revolution from everything, from everything which refer the leftist democratic character of the revolution. Imre Nagy and his colleagues were erased from the memory of the revolution, saying that they were communists. Yes, as I mentioned, they were communists, they were high-ranking communists, but later they turned against the di dictatorship and they became martyrs. But even the statue of Imre Nagy was not tolerated at the central square of Budapest, and the, the, the statue was removed and re-erected in a less frequent place of Budapest. But later I will tell the, the story of the Nagyimre statue. So the aim of the revolution has also been blurred. Freedom fighters fought for independence and for democracy. But the new narratives is nationalist and anti-Western and conceals the fact that one of the main demands of the freedom fighters and the nation as a whole was the rest restoration of democracy. In 2017, in his commemoration speech, Mr. Orban said the following. It reflects the essence of the new memory politics. The West did not understand that the Hungarian revolution was a national revolution. They did not understand that, that we were fighting for our culture, our values, our way of life. We do not want to melt in the melting pot of the European Union. That is why Brussels does not understand us. In the 20th century, the great military powers started wars and caused trouble. In the 21st century, global financial powers are rising. They have no borders in the physical sense but they have media, they bribe, they bribe tens of thousands of people. These new powers are strong and brutal. So the speech, this speech make it seem as if the whole nation would have fought not against the Soviet occupation, but the real or the imagined rivals of the Orban regime, namely the, the European Union, the European Union and the so-called global by financial powers. It is interesting, it is interesting that the commemoration speeches concern the memory, the, comm the commemoration speeches concern the memory of the forced laborers, or the memory of the revolution, neither refer to the, to the responsibility of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Soviet Union is not mentioned. The West and liberalism are blamed for all traumas, for all for all failures of the past. Uh, another constant element of memory politics is the analogy, analogy between the capital of the European Union, Brussels and Moscow. Memory politics opposes, uh, no, memory politics proposes an equivalency between the former Soviet bloc and the European Union and emphasizing that the emphasizing the oppressive nature of both alliance. But accordingly to the influencers, 
accordingly to the propagandists of the regime, the European Union is a far greater threat to the nation than the communist regime of the time. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to speak on, uh, on, on the story of two memorials. Uh, the first memorial I would like to speak, it is, uh, it is the, the Memorial of National Martyrs. The, this memorial, it is a picture from the 30s. In 1934, a huge monument was erected for the victims of the Red Terror, the victims of the first communist dictatorship, which lasted 133 days in 1919. And uh, yes, I have another picture from the 30s. So this is dedicated for the victims of the first Hungarian communist dictatorship. Uh, after the Second World War, almost immediately after the liberation of Budapest in summer 1945, the monument was demolished. I have a picture when this monument was demolished. It was demolished uh, in, a, in an anti-fascist demonstration. I have another picture when this monument was demolished in the summer of, in the summer of 1945. And later, a fountain was built in its place. Uh, actually, it is, it is just at the central square of Budapest. Next, next uh, the parliament, the Hungarian parliament. It is really at the central place of Budapest. In 1996, however, a monument was set up in the place of the fountain for the owner of Imre Nagy, the head of the Hungarian revolution. And this is the, so, and this is the Nagy Imre statue. The monument was erected for the 40th anniversary of the revolution. The head of the revolution, the prime minister of the revolution, uh, Imre Nagy, stands on a bridge and it symbolizes his journey from being a hardliner communist leader uh, to the leader of the anti-communist revolution. And I have another picture when he's standing on the bridge. And so it's a, it's a very powerful monument, I think. And it was a popular monument. As I already mentioned, that Imre Noy, labored by the current regime as a communist, therefore his monument at the main square of Budapest was not tolerated. In an early morning, in 2019, his memorial was removed and as I, and as I mentioned later, re-erected on the last prominent place in Budapest. And in its place, the former once demolished but renovated National, National Martyrs Monument was placed. So it was re-erected. This is the re-erected National Martyrs Monument. And, uh, uh, this renewed monument, old new monument, was unveiled on October 31st, 2019. And the president of the Hungarian parliament, Arslo Kövér, said the inauguration speech. And I would like to deal with, the, with his speech in a, detail, in a detailed way, because this speech is a, is a summary of the worldview of the current regime. Uh, he presented in his speech, actually he, he, he is on the, he is, he is, he is there on the, on this, on this picture. He is on, the, he is at, at the middle of the picture. He presented the history of Hungary, especially the history of the last 150 years. And he presented this period as a continuous combat between those who work to maintain the thousand years old Christian Hungary and those who would like to destroy it. According to him, this combat began in the second half of the 19th century 
with the infield infiltration of left leftist, communist, and liberal ideas, which poisoned the nation. Actually, he said that these ideas, uh, this poison, yes, uh, yes, the liberal liber the poison of liberalism was injected to the body of the nation. He said this. Communist, socialist, and liberal intellectuals embedded the first communist dictatorship in 1990, according to him. He also underlined that the mentioned ideologies were not Hungarian ones, those were imported to Hungary, and their representatives were not Hungarians in spirit, even if they were born in Hungary, even if they had Hungarian names, even if they spoke Hungarians. The followers of the mentioned ideologies, as well as the leaders of the communist rule, were in reality foreign agents. These so-called foreigners wanted to destroy the Christian values, such as family, marriage fidelity, and the Hungarian culture as a whole. Last look of it, so the president of the Hungarian parliament, uh, was Laszlo Kovács main, the, his main message, his main message was that today's leftists and liberals are the heirs of the communists who trapped the country in 1919 and who killed the Hungarian patriots during the first communist dictatorship. He said the following in the inauguration speech, the, the descendants of the Lenin's boys are still around and they continue only virtually what Samueli and Cherny had stopped due to the defeat of their dictatorship. Samueli and Cherny were the leaders of the communist terror organization. What Mr. Kovea says that the opposition of the current government want to do the same what the communists did. They and their followers are not part of the Hungarian nation. They represent the interest of foreign powers. Therefore, they are foreign agents. Mr. Kovir did not mention that the white terror, white terror, which was followed by the red terror, and uh, which also had victims in large numbers. But anyway, uh, his view really represents the essence of the current memory politics. And I would like to speak about, uh, finally, about another memorial, uh, the history of the second monument. This is the, hist this is the second monument. Uh, I would like to speak, goes back to 2014. The government declared 2014 the Holocaust memorial years. 70 years before, as I mentioned, on 19th of March, 1944, the German army occupied Hungary and deportation began. Uh, so the monument, this, this is a monument of German occupation, and it was erected without any public debate, without, without any consultation with civil organizations or with, without any consultation with the Jewish community. Uh, this is the, this is a monument which ex, which expresses well the national martyrology, the attitude that we Hungarians were always victims. Uh, you can see an eagle on the on the on the photo. The eagle represents Nazi Germany, and uh, the Nazi Germany attacks Archangel Gabriel, which represents Hungary, and the broken columns symbolize broken lives. And there is only a short inscription on the monument, but it is in, but in many languages, for the memory of all victims of German occupation. So, uh, so the message of the monument is that it is not clear because who were the victims of the German occupation? The Jews were victims. It is, it is inevitable. Uh, and the message is that 
that we were not responsible for the Holocaust because because Hungary because that uh, Archangel Gabriel represents Hungary and Hungary is attacked by the Nazi eagle. We were occupied, so we were we were not responsible for what happened to the Jews after the occupation. This is one of the messages of the monument. But but who else were the victims of the German occupation? This is the question. The soldiers who were killed in action in the last year of the war, or civilians who were killed by the Anglo-Saxon air raids, or civilians who were killed by the Soviet army, advancing Soviet, ar Soviet army, or the prisoners of war who were deported to the Soviet Union. There, there are so many victim groups. And it is not clear that whether they were whether they were considered as the victims of German occupation or not. Anyway, this monument blurs the distinction among the different victim groups. Uh, after the erection of the monument, not only the Jewish community, but other organizations, the German embassy and the Israeli embassy protested. The government and personally Prime Minister Viktor Orban refused the critics and defended the concept of the monument, of the, of the monument. Nevertheless, the monument has never been officially inaugurated. Uh, from the part of the government, nobody dared to make an inauguration speech. So it was unveiled in an early morning, almost secretly, but it is still at the center of Budapest. So the government needed, uh, so I, I, I spoke about the memory politics and finally, just some final sentences. The government needed new institutions to represent and to develop its memory politics. Therefore, the government had to reorganize almost totally the network of research institutes, research in institutes. In the last couple of years, at least four new research institutes were established to work on new national historiography. At the same time, several so-called liberal research centers were closed. First of all, the Central European University, which was expelled from Hungary to Vienna. The Institute for Studying the History of 1956 was, was closed. The institutional network of the Hungarian Academy, Academy of Sciences was detached from the academy and was placed to, under the supervision of a new body, which is loyal to the government. Uh, what I would like to say that memory politics is a threat, is a threat to academic freedom. So that was my last sentence. And so the, the, the floor is open for, for discussion. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you so much uh, for your remarks today, which um, uh, give us a lot of information. And uh, it's, uh, it's not easy to process because it's, uh, it's about reworking history uh, and, uh, and reworking symbols. Um, I, I'm sure our audience has a lot of questions, but the thing that uh, provoked me most in your talk was um, your statement that uh, after the fall of communism, 80% of the Hungarian people uh, accepted, uh, were in favor of, of joining European Union and NATO. And one has to think, of course, many of these opinions may have been naive. They might not have known what these institutions meant. And it was just kind of a knee-jerk reaction to get away from what they used to have. And yet, uh, it seems like uh, it, that's such a huge number, a huge uh, figure, 80%. Do we know now where the, the population of Hungary uh, is on these issues? Is there real regret about having joined these institutions? Or is there just a hope that they can push these institutions uh, to more reflect the ideology that they have at home? Uh, the majority, according to the different uh, polls, the, the majority of Hungarians still support Hungary's membership at the European Union and also the Hungarian membership in NATO. As to the European Union, Hungarians support membership because 
earth, almost all or the greater part of Hungarian families has uh, members who work in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. So it is also a family issue. It's a personal issue to be a member to be a member of the European Union. So European Union is still very popular in Hungary, but at the same time, but at the same time, uh, there is a there is an anti-Western tendency which is propagated, which is pushed by the government for a decade, and it has an impact. It has an impact on the Hungarian population. Uh, and so I experience it. And for example, nowadays, speaking about the war against Ukraine, so Hungary is the only country in Europe, I think, which still conducts, pursues pro Russian policy and, and after the war, the pro-Russian character of the Hungarian policy is even stronger than before the war. So it is interesting, of course, not at one hand, at one, at one hand, Hungary as a NATO country, is, uh, is, it's, uh, uh, gave its consent that, uh, that uh, the number of American troops in Hungarian territory should be, uh, should be should be raised and as and uh, the military expenditure was also raised in Hungary because of the war but, but on the other hand if you see the media which is under the control of the government you see the Russian narrative about the war and uh, and I experienced that uh, in a large part of the Hungarian large part of the Hungarian public, there is a reception to this kind of propaganda. And probably the reason of this attitude, I do not know the reason of this attitude, but, but one of the reasons could be that after the fall of communism, we thought, the Hungarians thought that, that in the near future, Hungary should be as wealthy as, as Austria, probably. Mm. It did not happen. The living standard improved a lot in the last decades, but there is still a gap. So we were unable to catch up Western Europe and probably there is a disillusion among many Hungarians that uh, we remain poor. Of course, it is not the same situation as it used to be in the past, but still there is a disillusion, I think, and, and there is a strong propaganda. No? Uh, anyone would like to follow up? Yes. Um, I just ran away from uh, this history uh, uh, of my view. Um, thank you very much for the interesting presentation, uh, Mr. Stark. Uh, I have two questions. One is a more general and one is a more specific one. Uh, I start with the specific. It's about the Holocaust, the trauma of Holocaust. And I'm curious what you think about the role of the current Hungarian Jewish community leaders who are, you could say, are co-opted by the by the government uh maybe maybe you can speak about that like yeah, who, okay. who is not yeah. uh but their role i'm curious about the role in legitimizing the, the mm -hmm. government's agenda mm -hmm. or um, yeah. a narrative about the holocaust so that would be the specific one in the general i'm curious how do you see what are the key differences between uh um hungarian memory politics put by the Orban government and another regional uh, memory politics i'm thinking about poland for instance and there particular problems with Holocaust and, and, and the Polish uh, lives. Thank you. It is easier to, 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 to reply the first the first question. As to the Hungarian Jewish community, community, of course, I'm not a specialist. The Hungarian Jewish community, uh, there are, the Jewish community has different organizations. And uh, the largest, uh, most and the most traditional Jewish community or Jewish organization uh, in the past in general supported indirectly 
leftist parties and uh, and since and since uh, leaders party seized power uh, the ruling party want, wanted to to find allies in Jewish community and uh, in the traditional, the most traditional Jewish community was considered as a creation of the so-called Socialist Party. The Hungarian ruling party, the Fidesz, began to, to build up another Jewish organization. And uh, they began to support a small Jewish community it was a, it was, it was the Habad movement, and they came. Most, this movement came to Hungary from from New York City, from here, and uh, they began to organize themselves in the mid nineties. And the or Orban government supports this Jewish community. So now the government divided the Jewish community. So the traditional Jewish community is not supported, but this Habad, Habad movement, this Habad community, it is favored. And they really received huge amount of monies and different kinds of benefits. And that Jewish community is, which really supports the Orban regime. For example, the representative of this community, this Habad community, uh, attended the inauguration of this National Martyrs Monument. And, uh, and in a way, they legitimized what Mr. Kovir said. So the, the representative of the, of the Habad movement uh, presented a different kind of speech. And that speech was okay, but since he was there, his presence legitimated mm -hmm. the memory politics, which was presented by the head of the Hungarian parliament. Uh, so so the, the, the regime divided and, and they support this little, relatively little community, a little community with big money. And as the memory politics of the of Poland, I'm, I'm not specialist. I'm not not specialist of the memory politics of Poland, but but uh, uh, it is a, a nationalist memory politics, and uh, I know that they they fight with the uh, anti-Semitic heritage of Poland, or the anti-Semitic heritage of Polish history. But uh, what, but speaking about Poland, what I found very important to mention that uh, in the last decade, probably, we witnessed a reconciliation between Poland and Ukraine. And I, I, found it, it, I found it very important, this reconciliation, because it is also part of the, of the current memory politics in both countries, in Ukraine and also in Poland, because the Ukrainian-Polish relationship is really burdened in the past, since, since part of Ukraine used to be the part of, 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 of Great Polish kingdom in the Middle Ages, and then, and uh, and uh, eastern part of, of 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 Ukraine was a part of Poland in the interwar years. President Lviv was a part of Poland, and uh, there were serious ethnic tensions. After the German occupation, there was a constant fight between nationalist Ukrainian. Partisan Ukrainian partisan groups and the army of Krajowa. And as I heard, as I read, 
maybe hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians and Poles were killed. So massacres happened. It was really a burdened relationship. But in the last, de but in the last de case, these nations were able to probably to, to step over the past. And Poland became the greatest advocator of, of, new Ukraine, of, of independent Ukraine, and it's still the greatest supporter of Ukraine. So I, I would like to emphasize this. Yes, in the corner. Yeah, my understanding, I'm very student at uh, Columbia yes. Like throughout your speech, and basically a little bit following up, up on your second question, I, I, I think I did about two movements here. The first one is that, um, okay, so first of all, I think interpreting uh, history is not necessarily new, right? You go to first with the uh, monument that has been like throughout different times, we built a set a same place to create a different story, right? And the other one is that, as, as you mentioned, it's not only happening in Hungary, right? I think last week we had a we had a speech here presenting a pretty similar uh, story about Turkey and how the Ottoman Empire the history is used in Turkey. Um, mm -hmm. So when we take these two things, like first of all, okay, it's not new, and second of all, it's happening in other places. Then, uh, basically, based on your research, what what could be in Hungarian society or scholars like you? What, what are tools that maybe has been affected have been affected throughout? History to kind of build resilience, build resilience against that history is used, right? Because also when you spoke about the uh, Treaty of Trianon, right, that kind of reminded me of the this German dream of like greater German Empire after uh, the Treaty of Versailles, right? So these are not new phenomena, but what are tools to build resilience? Uh -huh. Situation is not easy, I think, because the Institute of History, my workplace, it used to be it, it used to belong to the to the network of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. But with other academic institutions, it was detached from the Hungarian Academy of Science. But but we are still but we remain free. So uh, and it is good to be free because it is, uh, so the Institute of History in my workplace, I, I, I'm proud to be the, the member of the Institute, the, uh, member of the Institute of History. And this is my first workplace and it will be my last workplace, I think. And, uh, uh, but, as I mentioned, so we can we are free to, to say anything. And the director of the institute told us many times that that we are free to speak and we are, we are free to 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 write even anti-government articles. Of course, in that case, we cannot use the name of the institute. <laughs> but we are free to to express our opinions, and, and it happens. But it is also true that we are not invited to the to that part of the media, to the greater part of the media, which work under the control of the government. Uh, I was invited quite often to the, to the central, to the central channel. I mean, the, the central channel of the Hungarian TV, or the channel number one. But in the last in the in the last ten years, I was not invited. And this is the story of my colleagues that we are not invited, or very, or we are invited very very seldom. Uh, the government tries to build up new new institutions which represent that kind of memory politics. Colleagues who are, who work there, they are invited to the media. They are questions. 
they have more opportunities to express their opinion openly. Uh, but uh, but uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't like to be in their shoes because as I know as I was informed that they are they have to they they have to ask permission from the head of the institute when they when they give an interview or they they have to ask permission for going to the TV and they are not really free I think. So it is, it is difficult to be independent. It is also a financial question, but uh, I think we always have to try. That's, uh, yeah. Yes, question here. Yeah. So thank you very much for your presentation. I shall not be here the So if, if you know, uh, already mentioned that the uh, Similar trends in memory uh, politics exist also in other uh, countries, especially in Central Eastern Europe, so Ukraine, Russia, Poland, the Balkans, and so on and so on. So, what is, in your opinion, uh, the origin of this liberal memory politics? So, the fact that today uh, uh, political institutions use uh, memory politics for, to justify liberal terms, and does the European Union politics of memory, uh, let's say, facilitate this? And I think you hear about um, uh, the case of Hungary and the proposal to, to fight Heineken, <clears throat> sorry, because of the Red Star. So, uh, and the European Commission agreed to this proposal. So, the law has not been adopted, but at least we have this example. And um, <clears throat> sorry. one another thing is uh, the relationship between institution and memory. Uh, you mentioned it. Uh, so, this is, let's say, also a part of my research. And uh, in relation to the Hungarian constitution, uh, I never understood what uh, does it mean historical constitution, what is called in the constitution. So if you can explain this. Historical constitution? Yes. So, because in, in the preamble, it is mentioned uh, that. Yes, it's the national confession. It begins yeah, with the yeah, national confession. There is a continuity between the current constitution and the historical constitution. And so, this is something that. Uh, it is not clear uh, to me. It is not clear for me. So what? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So so we, we Hungary had no constitutions for many in the past. Yes, the communist one was the first. The first constitution was the communist one, which was released nineteen forty nine. Yeah. That was the communist. It was called also the Stalinist constitution. And after the fall of the communism, there was a debate in Hungary what to do with the constitution because it was a because it was a really a communist constitution. And uh, so the outcome of the debate was that uh, that we have to change some basic things in the constitution, but in general it, it but in general it remained. So that uh, and the, the the new regime decided to, to torn down the past totally. And we did not need this, the, the constitution, which, which was rooted in the Stalinist era, and we need a new constitution. And, it, and uh, the word historical was used because, because since we had no constitution before the communist regime, but uh, but there, but there were preambulums in the Middle Ages, mm. and and this new constitution is somehow it's it's a, it's a is the heritage of the old preambulum from the Middle Ages. So so there is that so it's there is a continuation between the Middle Ages. And 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 current times that this new constitution tries to preserve the uh, the old values and uh, the, and Christianity is emphasized that Hungary that Hungary is a Christian nation so it's a, it, so the constitution has a in a, in a historical case I I can tell you and. And it begins with the national confession, 
which, which is a summary of the Hungarian past. Yes. Uh, my question relates to that. Hi, I'm, I'm Jennifer. I'm a master's student at Columbia. And I'm curious, my understanding is that Hungary is not a very religious country. Um, you know, it's more like the Czech Republic and like Poland in, in that respect. So why is this rhetoric about Christianity specifically, and if he does his rhetoric about, you know, Christian values, why is that so effective? I mean, I understand in the preamble to the constitution referencing, you know, King Stephen. Yeah. But why is Christianity specifically so powerful? It is, it, is, it is interesting because that's true that, that in general, the Hungarian society is, a, is an atheist one. Uh, but it's, it's interesting because I think most Hungarians think that Hungary should be a Christian state. Hungary should be a Christian nation. But but only a little fraction, probably less than five percent of the population, go to church or visit church. I mean, every Sunday. So there is a discrepancy here. But uh, but Christianity is presented by the by the politic by the representatives of representatives of the political life, the representatives of the ruling elite. That uh, it is not a question of religion. It is a question of culture. So when, when the government speaks about Christianity, the government thinks about the so-called Christian past or the Christian culture. But it is a, but it is a difficult subject because uh, it is also exploited by the government. A uh, couple of years ago, Hungary had to face the, the flow of migrants from the Middle East. And from the Far East, and you know, Hungary blocked, Hungary closed the border, and there was a very brutal campaign against migrants. And um, one of the messages of messages of the campaign was that Hungary, as a Christian country, cannot cannot uh, uh, allow that the country should be occupied by migrants who are Muslims. So this anti-migrant campaign had a, in a way, had a racist character in Hungary, that, uh, and, and, which, was, which was problematic, I think, that even Christian churches more or less supported this campaign, that we have to defend our Christian past by closing the border against the migrants who came who came from Muslim countries, and there were posters, huge posters, that the uh, that the, the migrants probably would like to occupy Hungary, and uh, and there is a reminiscence to the Middle Age because in the Middle Age there was a famous slogan or motto that Hungary is the bulwark of Christian civilization because Hungary, Hungary was attacked by Ottoman Turkey. And that was really a motto from the Middle Ages. And, the, and, it, was, uh, and, and it was used again in recent years that Hungary became a bulwark of the Christian civilization again because of the migrants. And we do just the same what Hungarians did in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, we stopped the Ottoman Empire, and now we stop the migrants from the from the Middle East. Uh, so the slogan was was renewed that Hungary is the bulwark of the Western civilization. So it is it, 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 it is interesting. So that so the Christianity is used in this sense, but it was also interesting uh, because because last year Ukrainian refugees came to Hungary in great numbers. And the policy changed because Hungary opened this border for the for the Ukrainian refugees. Yes, because Ukrainians were considered as Christians, and and they were accepted. Of course, only a very small number of Ukrainian refugees remained in Hungary. So in po Poland, received about two million refugees. Half a million refugees came and settled at the Czech Republic 
more than 100 refugees came to Slovakia, more than 100 settled in Romania. In Hungary, the number of those Ukrainians who settled in Hungary must be put at 30,000, only 30,000. Yes, question here. Okay, please bear with me because I'm not a historian. Uh, I'm a member of the lay public who has come here. Um, I'm 81 and I remember very clearly about the Hungarian Revolution because I read the newspapers that spoke about it. And in my class at the City College, there was a young man uh, who was who had uh, immigrated to uh, the United States immediately after the Hungarian Revolution. He, you know, he came out. Um, of course, all of Victor uh, Orban's arguments or presentations, to me as an American, seems absolutely absurd. Okay? <laughs> However. Hitler also said incredibly absurd things and was quite successful. So the question now is, and I may say something which is unappealing and unattractive, but I heard you use certain words such as Hungary priding itself on being Christian Hungary, you used the terminology, I mean, it was from the board as well, of foreign agents somehow, yeah, yeah, yes. you know, from the West undermining yeah. Hungary. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there was also the expression there, global financial interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> exactly. Uh, also, you said about the poison, the poison yeah. of liberalism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, that the uh, another was the leftists and liberals are somehow descendants of uh, Lenin. That Hungary suffered more uh, than the Jews, and that uh, the Jews there was no anti-Semitism, despite the fact that the Jews were sent to Galicia during the war. To me, this sounds like maybe not um, overt anti-Semitism, but absolute anti-Semitism. And from what you're saying, I think that that, you know, look, I'm not a great thinker, mm -hmm. but it seems to me that this is really one of the major uh, reasons why Orban is, is acting the way he is, saying what he's saying, and maybe this is the reasons why the Hungarians population, a, a great part of it, is supporting them. So am I being paranoid? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so you are right, I think. But it is interesting because uh, I heard this kind of conspiracy theories since the early 90s. But at that time, these con this conspiracy theories were uh, presented by, by small groups. And these theories were, were presented in papers, which was circulated in very small numbers. So it was an absolute marginal phenomenon in Hungary to use conspiracy theories. And surprise, surprise, the <laughs> conspiracy theories became the official theory of the Hungarian government in a way. And it is a shame, but, uh, but that happens. And it is very difficult to understand how it happened, but it is true. The situation is the same as in Russia because the uh, Russian government and the Russian propaganda also uses conspiracy theories. And in Hungary, it is, it, it is widespread that, that, for, that, uh, that the global, global financial power uh, uh, rules the world. It's, it's and uh, it is spread by, even by the prime minister mentioned. 
many Hungarians accept or believe, or believe it. I do not really know why or how could it happen, but of course it is always easy to, to believe in conspiracy theories, because if you believe in a conspiracy theory, you should think that you have a key which is good for every lock, so that you can understand the word easily because you know that whom you should blame. And so the financial power it is. So if you watch the Hungarian TV, you can, you can hear it. And even the opposition of the current government, the opposition party is also blamed or blamed as the, as the agents of the financial, of the global financial power, it is used. And, I, and a, a new expression turned up, the, the dollar left. Dollar left, which means that that the leftists, the leftist movement, the leftist parties, actually there are no re real leftist parties in Hungary, but the so-called <laughs> leftist parties are supported by are supported by the United States, by the global financial powers, by the Biden administration. They received money for the election last year. They are supported by the financial power it, 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 it receiving dollars, US dollars. And that's an accusation and uh, many Hungarians believe it because it is good to believe in conspiracy theories. You can feel yourself smart. Okay, one other point. You said that there was, uh, that the Jews are divided and uh, there was a group that came from America and you use the term Chabad or Chabad? Chabad, Chabad movement. Chabad movement. Are you talking about the Chabad? Yeah. Oh, okay. So the Chabad movement, this is like startling to me. The Chabad movement sent Jews, uh, or there were a group of them that came to Hungary uh, and are supporting this. I, I, I would believe that easily of the Satva. But uh, the Chabad are. Uh, I have never heard that feeling uh, about the Chabad. The Chabad have always been very, uh, I don't know what you would say, more liberal minded, mm -hmm. certainly. It's, it's very strange to me. Uh, I, so, I do not know. I do not know. In, I do not know de details about how this Hungarian community was born. Yeah. But uh, some leaders came from from New York City to Hungary, who had Hungarian background, right. and and they began they began to organize this this movement in the 90s. At that time, they were absolutely independent from the political power, right. but I think this movement was exploited by the by the current Hungarian regime, and they 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 wanted to 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 build up a Jewish community which was supportive for them, which, which, which was supported, supportive, which was supportive to the, to the government. And it is still a little movement, but they are very active. They have a very good homepage and uh, they published huge amount of books, interesting books. I think they do a good job in general, but on the other hand, so since they are financed by the government, in a way they legalize. The, the, the regime they legalized that for, for example the uh, uh, the Hungarian the, the American ambassador in Hungary organized a, organized a meeting last week and and he invited the, the representatives of the traditional Hungarian Jewish community but not the representatives of this smaller Jewish community which is supported by the government. So, so there are different kind of Jewish organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, question Thank back. You. Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Christina Peter. I'm a librarian at the law school here. And I have two questions. One is a smaller one. 
when we were uh, showing those startling images of the recent uh, Trianon memorials, two of them feature this cross with the double arms, which to the best of my knowledge is not, not strictly speaking a religious symbol, since none of the Christian churches use that as a symbol. So could you say what a cross reference is? That was my first small question. The other one was uh, more like a comment about the question of the Ukrainian immigrants in, in or migrants, whether or oh, yes. people to the refugees from yeah. Ukraine to Hungary. I happened to be in Budapest when the war broke out, and uh, there was an enormous spontaneous outpouring of sympathy towards the Ukrainian refugees, which I saw that people started collecting, churches, schools started collecting for. Uh, just, just totally spontaneously, people who had cars were driving to the border. Um, and then you, you were saying that the number of Ukrainians who actually stayed in Hungary is very small. I was wondering whether the populist sentiment changed considerably in the wake of the very strong pro Russian uh, uh, Orban rhetoric, or, or what, what the reason, yeah, or, what reason is why so few, few of those refugees in Hungary so, compared to the... As to the double cross, what, what I can tell you that this, this double cross is from the Hungarian uh, national arm, so the Hungarian national emblem. You know that at the right hand side of the national emblem, there is a double cross. And, and this double cross from this double cross comes from, from this national emblem. It is, it is not really a, a, a symbol, symbol of, it is a symbol of Christianity, but not the symbol of the Catholic Church, for example. So it is. It's more about a great country. Yes, it is. It is, from the, it is from, the, from the historical emblem or the historical symbol of Hungary, this double cross. Actually, actually, the double cross is also used in the in the Slovak, in the Slovak national emblem. It is also used. It's associated with Saint Stephen. It, it is associated with Saint Stephen. It is oh, not okay. every day, yes. yes, it is associated. So the, about the Ukrainian refugees, yes, they were they were welcome in general, and I think that they are still welcome in Hungary. And the propaganda tried to try to exploit this because the Hungarian Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, <laughs> many times that 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 Hungary that Hungary uh, carried out the greatest humanitarian action in its history because because we received more than one million refugees from Ukraine, which is at one hand it was true because really many Ukrainians came to Hungary, but most of them stayed in Hungary a day, only a day, or less than a day, because they just crossed Hungary. So the, the real reason of refugees who remained in Hungary is really very small. I think that they were, uh, they were welcome in general, and uh, they received some kind of assistance. And, uh, uh, it is interesting because at one hand, Ukrainian refugees in general are well received, but on the other hand, the, the cause of Ukraine, the cause of Ukraine is not really understood by many Hungarians. And it is, it is pity and it is, it is shame because my opinion is that what happens in Ukraine, it is, it is a Hungarian Case or it is a it, it is a, it is an important cause for Hungary, uh, and uh, so that this was the re uh, that was the reason that uh, that uh, two weeks ago I went to Ukraine uh, because I I wanted to express my solidarity okay. solidarity of Hungarian colleagues with Ukrainian colleagues. Uh, there was a conference, an international conference in Lviv two weeks ago, and uh, the conference was about the 
this 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 was the leaf that for the conference mm -hmm. the Jews the Jews of East Central Europe after the catastrophe. So it, it it is related to the Holocaust, what happened to the remnant of the of, of the Jewish communities. So the conference was held in, in V, March 27, 28. And uh, I wanted to go there and uh, because it was an act of an expression of solidarity. And I think it was important. And I wanted to do this in a to, in a bit to counterpart or overpower the, the overpower that that uh, the government propaganda, the government propaganda. And this was it was a very great experience to be in Ukraine, to be to be in Lviv, to be in a war torn country. So that was it, it was it, it was a very elevating feeling. Uh, there were eighteen speakers, and out of eighteen speakers, there were only five who who attended the conference in person. There were two colleagues from Ukraine, one from Kiev, another one from Lviv, and there were three colleagues from from abroad one from Poland, one from France, and I was from Hungary. And the conference was held in a shelter. Mm -hmm. There was no, there, so we were in, so we were, we were in a safe place, but anyway, Lviv was not directly attacked in the past. So it is still a peaceful town. But anyway, the conference was held in a, in a shelter. So it was, it was a historical moment, but it is important. And my, my my colleagues appreciated appreciated this visit. It was appreciated, and uh, I think it it is important. So this is what we can do. Yes. Hi, I'm Samuel Albert. I teach in the Art History Department. Uh, I, you know, I'm sorry I missed the beginning of your talk. You know, you discussed this, but I was in Hungary this past fall. On the Fulbright, had the opportunity to see all of these monuments. One of the things that struck me that very few people seem to talk about is just in what bad taste they are. <laughs> just not good. Well, thank you. The robot looks like a, a, a five year old said, Oh, train guard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. None of them have robot any robot subtlety yes. or depth. You know, the, the composer of the Mylan Key Robot Monument is the same who composed this. This this monument, the same. Oh, person. That didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> the same person. Uh, yes, I did not speak over the Malenki robot monument. Yes, sir. Yes, it was erected as a couple of years ago because it was erected 2016 because that year was dedicated for the memory of Hungarians who were deported to the Soviet Union, and the little museum was also created. And in front of the museum, there is the Smilenki robot monument with the with, with, with the, uh, a train coach, with the train coach which represented the deportation. Uh, that idea also came, I think, from the Yad Vashem, because in the Yad Vashem you can see it, uh, in a monument with the with the with the train coach. So it was in a way in a replica, it's but that but that coach. monument of the Yad, Yad Vashem was created. In the early sixties, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's in a different time. Uh, yes, it is not. Oh, uh, it, I do not like uh, this this monument. Uh, they are not good monuments. <laughs> but 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 but, but, but uh, there is a very good Gulag Gulag monument at the Hon Honvéd Square mm -hmm. in Budapest. Unfortunately, I wrote a picture on the Gulag monument. And that that was erected in the early nineties. And it is really a good one because it symbolizes it's a it's a, it's a huge stone. It is it is symbolizes a human body, and the stone is broken. And it is a good monument. I think I like that monument. But these monuments are, are yes. yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe thank you for that question. Right, I think it's in Sofia, right, in North Macedonia, where basically the city is plastered with this kind of monument to rewrite the history, right, or like make sure the story is told over the place. But as a historian, like how important are these monuments actually? Because if usually they're 
really ugly in reality, right? Like, do people actually look at that? Is it like, let's say we go to Washington right, and see all these monuments that people actually take in as a mon monument? Or is it more like a political move to like plaster a city with like storytelling? But don't, like, the people, do they actually look at the monument and they, you know what I mean? Like, what's the perception yeah, so of how powerful speak is, is speaking about the the National Artist Monument or the Gulag or the uh, the Gulag, the Malenki robot or the Gulag Monument. I think uh, most Hungarians uh, have no idea about the meaning of these monuments. So mm -hmm. they are not interested. They just passed away. Uh, in case of this, uh, the, that monument, the monument for the victims of German occupation, it's a different story because I do not have a picture, but uh, close to the monuments, uh, there are many posters. And the, the posters criticizes the monument. And, the po and there are many posters which, which try to, to tell the story of the Holocaust to those Hungarians who, who are walking there. So at, at one hand, there is a monument and very close to the monument, if you are there, if you are, if you are on the spot, you can see many little posters which criticize the monument. So it is a form of resistance, if you like, that uh, uh, they, 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 they try to, to tell the real story what happened after the German occupation and, and tell the story of the Holocaust because, because this monument cannot speak what happened what really happened in Hungary after the German occupation. So in that case, this story, this, this monument is different because, because it, is, it is really criticized openly. And if you are there, you can see there are so many posters and pictures about deported Hungarians. Uh, you can experience it. That's encouraging. Uh, one of our um, uh, guests who's following on Zoom has a question. Uh, is there surveillance of the opposition in Hungary? Surveillance of the opposition? Mm -hmm. Of course, I do not know. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> uh, there was a so-called Pegasus scandal. Yes. There was a Pegasus scandal in Hungary, and it turned out that, that journalists were surveyed or Tabbed, is it expression? Good expression. Sure, yeah. Journalists were tabbed, so, and uh, and even politicians, yes. But yeah, we heard about it. But the opposition want, wanted to set up at the committee at the Hungarian Parliament to to investigate what happened. And uh, the ruling party did not support <laughs> this initiative of the opposition. And finally, nothing happened. So, of course, we can read about it in, in papers, in home pages, which are not controlled by the government. But in the Hungarian public life, somehow this Pegasus scandal was. It, it, it went through the Hungarian public life without any great scandal, unfortunately. So probably, yes, the opposition was surveyed or, or tapped mm -hmm. by the Pegasus on, or by different way. Of course, we do not know it exactly. But it could happen. It could happen. Yeah, that's one good question. We are, we'll yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to go help. Um, I want to ask about um, alternative models of national identity and uh, their viability in um, Hungary. And yeah, we mentioned uh, Poland here, and you know, Poland and Hungary are so similar with the tradition of martyrology and being the bulwark of Christianity and thinking of themselves as um, kind of victims throughout history. Um, but uh, if, on the other hand, Poland also does have this very powerful tradition of of um, of um, I suppose what of leftist culture of diversity, uh, in particular, I mean, one of its major exports is its leftist culture, its cinema, its art, its Nobel Prize winners, um, and they're constantly a uh, a balance and a sort of um, 
uh, you know, a counterpoint to um, any, you know, authoritarian regime that attempts to push a single narrative of Polish national identity in the country. So I'm wondering if there, and you know, a lot of those leftist um, uh, traditions in Poland emphasize diversity. They emphasize, as you mentioned, Polish-Ukrainian cooperation, Polish-Belarusian, Polish-Jewish. Um, is there anything in Hungary uh, that might present itself as an alternative vision of the nation other than the sort of, you know, sort of blood and religion language is, you know, something that might unite, you know, because, uh, you know, ultimately the kingdom of Hungary was multi-ethnic and it's Slovakian, it's Romanian, yeah, it's true. Croatian. So, and so is there anything that might point yes. to that tradition of coexistence and diversity as an alternative model? I think that the alternative model was that that Hungary is a European country and we belong to the West. So that was the model I remember after the fall of communism. Uh, national, nationalism at that time was not emphasized at all. But uh, everybody was happy that Hungary became a free country and we wanted to belong to the Western civilization. At that time, at that time, uh, this nationalist approach was not really popular. So that the European idea that that was popular, that uh, the multi-party system, democracy, and uh, the West in general was very attractive. And the Western society was considered as a role model, as a role model for Hungary. Uh, even the, the Socialist Party uh, supported Hungary's membership in the NATO and the Europe and the European Union because it, 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 it was a common opinion that Hungary needs to go to the needs, Hungary needs to follow the, the Europe, the Western European model. But the Hungarian, the current Hungarian Prime Minister said that that was a dead end road. And that was a dead end road, and 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 we need to find we need to find find our, our roots. And this nation, this nationalist rhetoric became the mainstream rhetoric instead of the European one. So that that was the alternative rhetoric or the alternative narrative, and. The parties of the opposition, opposition still use Europe, or still you, you still use Europe as a as, as a symbol of democracy, and 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 as a and as a possible way for Hungary for the future. So we have no alternative. So we have to be act as a European nation. We belong. We belong to Europe, and we belong to the Western civilization. So, so at one hand, there is a there, there is a there is a nationalistic narrative, and in the past, in the in the interwar period, and in the past, there was all, there was always a nationalistic narrative. But on the other hand, there was a so-called European narrative, and after the and during the Hungarian Revolution, 1956. And after the fall of the communism, this European narrative became the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Now the nationalist narrative, but opposition still represent this European narrative. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining us for this talk, and thank you again for your insights. <laughs>